المحاضرة عن الستة والندوة السادسة من هالسلسلة. Okay. Um, I want to welcome you. My name is Anna Forenran. I'm the executive manager of ICANN and facilitating this uh, combined collaboration between Africa CDC and ICANN. This is our series nine, week six. Um, and we can just let you know that there will be one week break and then we will start with series 10, which will also then run over six weeks. Once every week on a Wednesday, the same time for the English session with Portuguese and Arabic translation. And then the French session will be on a Thursday at one o'clock South African time. So if I can just ask for some housekeeping rules, please keep your microphones muted. Please keep your videos off to ensure a good bandwidth. And then if you have any questions, just please, please paste them in the Q&A box and not in the chat box. We will try and address them as soon as possible. And if we've got enough time at the end, we will address the, some of them live. Um, what we also want to introduce, make sure is that you will get a certificate of attendance if you've registered and attended at least four out of the six for per series and that you've already stayed on for at least 16 minutes um, for each of the sessions. Um, that will be then sent to you um, through Africa CDC from Susan. If you do have any queries, you can either contact to Susan or myself, and we will try and address all the questions that they will be. We will also, after permission from all the presenters, post all the presentations from all the series on the um, ICANN website, and all the ones that has been recorded will be on the ICANN YouTube, um, also available, so you will have to then log into our I can website this currently being uploaded. So just give us a few days to make sure everything is there. Without further ado, I want to hand over, and I'm just going to stop sharing. Um, just hand over to Ms. Chika Okuhendu from Africa CDC, who is going to give us a short update on the status of um, COVID-19. Over to you, Chika. Okay, thank you, Doctor. So um, let me quickly share my screen. Good afternoon, colleagues. Um, good afternoon, participants online. Um, my name is Chika, and I'm, I'm going to take you through the epidemiological situation as of today, 20th October 2021. Okay, so um, here is the global epidemiological situation of COVID-19 update as of 8.23 p.m. Central European time, 19th October, 2021 from the WHO. And um, on the left shows the world map of um, affected countries. And therefore the charts on the left shows you the distribution of new cases in the week by six um, geographic regions. Hope I'm audible enough and you can see my screen. Yes, you are. Please go. Okay. Okay, thank you. So um, Africa within the red bars, accounts for 3.5% of the worldwide um, cases. Overall, the, the globe has recorded over 240 million confirmed cases of COVID-19, of which over 4.9 million have died. The case fatality rate still accounts for 2% of um, 225 countries and territories burdened from the pandemic. So um, this slide illustrates the epidemiological situation of COVID-19 in Africa as of today, 20th October 2021, 9 a.m. East African time. And um, we're focusing at the COVID-19 um, situation and the map on the left depicts the distribution of cumulative cases confirmed by 53 AU member states. And um, the epic curve on the right is showing the the COVID-19 cases reported daily by regions. And the red lines represent the seven days moving average that shows a continuously reported cases in the uh, 55 member states. Um, the Africa figures indicates over 
million cases, 215,000 deaths, leading to a case fatality rate of 2.6% and over 7.8 million recoveries, of which 93% um, people have recovered from COVID-19 across the continent. However, the cases reported on a downward um, trend. So this table is displaying the distribution of COVID-19 new and cumulative cases, deaths and recoveries by AU regions. As of 9 a.m. today, for the last 24 hours, over 5,000 new um, cases, about 250 deaths, and then um, over 6,700 new recoveries are reported from um, 53 okay. member states within the past um, week. And the majority of the, the new cases reported from the Eastern okay. regions, though the Southern region this day reported <laughs> almost the number of new deaths, new recoveries. This day, oh, wow. um, six countries accounted for 84% of the new COVID-19 cases reported. They have South Africa, Egypt, Morocco, Ethiopia, Rwanda, and Burundi. And then um, Rwanda alone accounted for 40% of all the new cases reported on the continent today. Okay, so moving on to the incidents per 1 million population per day by AU member states this week, that's this epi week 40, we classified the incidents into 41, I mean to say, we classified the incidents into um, five categories with new cutoff points to match that of the COVID-19 tiered public health and social measures uh, framework for Africa. In the past epidemiological week, um, 30 countries reported less than to five new cases per 1 million population per day, and 14 countries reported between five and less than 20 new cases per 1 million population per day. Six countries reported between 20 and less than 18 new cases per 1 million population per day. And while three countries are reporting equal to or more than 80 new cases per 1 million population per day. And um, this week, this every week, we do not have information for two member states. So um, this slide is showing the COVID-19 case fatality rate by AU member states. Um, there are five categories here. Um, 10 countries have a CFR that is less than or equal to 1%. 18 countries have a CFR that is greater than one and lesser than 2%. Um, percent. Um, 24 countries have a CFR that is greater than two and lesser than 5%, while three countries have a CFR greater than 5%. So with regards to testing, this graph illustrates the cumulative testing conducted all together the AU member states um, by regions. Over 75 million tests are conducted across the continent with uh, 8.9 tests per reported cases. And the general positivity rate is 11.2%. Um, um, so the brown and the red bars represents the new tests and the new cases respectively. The black moving line is the percentage positive. Currently, um, on a downward movement for the week of for every week 41 and then um, other um, previous weeks. So um, here, I think uh, member states should be encouraged to do more of testing because if they are not, uh, if, if there is an inadequate um, testing, we won't be able to detect the uh, number of um, cases. So it's not a good sign that the, testing um, by member states, are the, that's the testing conducted at member states are reducing. So we advise that um, um, more testing should be done for member states to see what the situation is actually is. So uh, lastly, observing the test positivity by AU member states for the past epidemiological week this week, we classified the test positivity also into five categories with new cutoff points to match 
that of um, COVID-19 tiered public health and social measures framework for Africa. And then 23 countries have test positivity less than um, 3%. Seven countries have test positivity between 3 to 5%. Seven countries have test positivity from 5 to 12%. Um, percent and four countries have a test positivity equal to or greater than 12%. Um, we do not have lab information for 14 countries um, this epi week, 41. Um, thank you for listening. And that is all from here. Over to you, colleagues. Thank you very much, Dika. Um, it was wonderful to see you, Nick. It's so great to see that there is a downward coming of um, new cases and um, deaths as well. Without further ado, I just want to remind everybody that there will be translation in um, Portuguese and in Arabic simultaneously. The slides will be posted on the ICANN website um, and we will have um, the certificates if you attend at least four out of the six. I see there's a lot of questions about that already. I want to now hand over to Dr. Yaku Nice, whom is a senior researcher at the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, um, shortly CSIR, and he's going to talk about the design of healthcare facilities for droplet and airborne pathogens. First, he's going to talk about the architectural needs. We will have a short break for the interpreters as well, and then he will carry on about looking at ventilation uh, before we hand over to Dr. Agostino Numbeti from Mozambique that's going to do his presentations. Please post all your questions in the Q&A box and we will see how soon and who we can answer. So if I can take this and hand over to Dr. Yaku, you can share your screen. Welcome again to our webinar, Dr. Yaku Nice. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Anna. I trust that you can see my screen. Is it possible? Yes, we can. Great. Thank you, Anna. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, welcome to uh, everyone has, that has joined us this morning, to all the delegates. To see, I had a quick read through where everyone's from, and it's fantastic to see that we've almost represented the entire Africa and portions of Europe, and obviously South Africa as well. So that's, that's, that's great. Sort of, it feels like we're like an Africa summit. So, <clears throat> thank you for putting out the time this morning, and I hope that you will you will you will gain some gain some new knowledge this morning, and hopefully you'll be able to apply it at your places of work and the environments that you're on a daily day to day basis. Um, so let's get straight into it. So, what are we going to speak about? this afternoon or this evening wherever that is that you are at the moment in the continent so we're going to speak about health and we're going to give a brief overview and because it's important to find the relevance of that within why and how we relate that to the built environment and then we're going to quickly overview rpc infection prevention control <clears throat> look at how um, hai so a healthcare acquired infection but it's a bit more than just hai healthcare it's also in other environments and then we'll look at some design considerations. We're going to look at a new field called MOBI, which is microbiology of the built environment. And then go into a bit more depth of ventilation strategies um, that are specifically relevant to your workplaces and your application to that. And then I'm going to look at some case studies and, and approaches that you can consider um, when considering materials and applications and, and the way that we need to approach um, when you get involved or part of infrastructure planning and decision making, how you need to think about that. So, I'm going to throw a few numbers out there. <clears throat> I'm not sure if numbers look familiar in any way. Um, they shouldn't. Well, they should because you deal with them every day. Um, but this is quite important because this sort of sets the tone for why. COVID has happened and why we are experiencing as many um, global pathogen outbreaks um, and at the rate we are currently. So the first number for expected life expectancy on this 5.3 years is what you're expected to live. Current data, this is like now. Um, 
if you're living in a developed world country, let's say the comparison is always the States, United States, that number jumps up to almost in the region of 75. But this, in Africa, it's going to be 65.3. Of that, 86% of your time, you are going to be spending indoors. That is a very big number. You'll be spending about 70% of that indoors time will be at your house. You'll be sleeping 30% of that time away, never to see again, resting so that you can spend that time not sleeping. Then about 8%. And obviously this varies depending on your lifestyle, but on the average, uh, this doesn't add up to 100 Yes, um, that number is the most important one. And this is how much time are we actually spending? My ventilation, design, planning is so critically important because we can have the best solutions in as far as, and we know antibiotics is a, is a, is a, is a last problem, um, last cause almost at this stage. And not just come up with solutions to our problems all the time. We actually need to start looking at the environments that we're in more than just the direct health applications um, for the 2020. And these are critical numbers for you. 2020, looking at about 50% of the seven and a half billion people globally reside in urban environments. It's a lot of people living in densely closed populated spaces. The reason why we have had as many outbreaks over the last 20 years, and of the most recent one had the most severe or global awareness, let me say awareness impact, has been COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 and all its variants. That number is expected to increase to 68%, which is almost 5 billion people by 2050. So what we are experiencing now is going to be exponentially more in the future if we do not get this right. In Africa, by 2060, in the next 40 years, in other words, it's going to be a 300% migration to urban centers. We are going to see about 395 million, to, moving up to 1.3 billion people staying in urban centers. And that changes the game completely. Um, and we need to think about this now, because if we don't start thinking about how we deal with this now, it'll be too late to think about it later. So that's why thinking about healthy indoor environments is so critically important. And not just healthcare, but all other indoor environments. So I'm going to use South Africa as a case sample for data. Currently, we're sitting at about just under 60 million. Um, when we consider HII rates, um, we've got a 9.8 per right? Um, we're in developing Yaku. countries that, yes. Sorry, Yaku. Um, your voice is just sometimes uh, seems as if it's dropping that we can't hear you. So I'm not sure if it's just your microphone if you can just maybe just check that for us please Let me see if i can make my sound a little bit louder i don't know if that's more clear yeah thank you okay let me do that let me maximize my sound okay let's see how old. um in the developing world countries the estimated hr rates and again if you say estimated we don't have clear um statistics on this uh, we don't have good reporting processes. Number is 15. That number is 15.5 per 100 people. Uh, my opinion, an underestimation. And obviously now the cost of this, of occupational disease, has not been counted as much in, in Africa um, as it has been in, for example, the United States, where that cost is costing the USA 46 billion annually. I can only imagine what that is costing us in this country and in the rest of Africa. Because HI is an occupational di uh, disease data in South Africa, it's lacking limited studies that are showing us how we need to deal with it, studies that are working on surveillance, studies that are that we can actually gain immediate response and, and by that have outcomes. 
And then to sort of make things slightly more complex, um, COVID being sort of a great awareness position for this. When we look at uh, uh, COVID-19, and my data that I've got on here is a little bit old, um, but the COVID-19 cases um, is was at one stage, 267, 2,675 per 100,000. Look at it in comparison to something like tuberculosis, um, which we know is is in severity much larger impact, um, lasting. Um, I know if you can see that my net, if I, if I might, if I if there's a bit of a drop in, it's because I seem to have slightly bad network this morning. But I'm gonna let's hope it gets better. There must be some load shedding somewhere. Um, so when we consider if, uh, from an epidemiological perspective, a, a, uh, consider a, uh, uh, an outbreak or something that is uh, of a disastrous nature, um, then we look at 300 per 100,000. But we are sitting at 615 and we look at high incident rates areas, we're looking at over 1,100 on TV. Um, with a mortality rate of uh, 58,000 people and a co-infection of 62% on HIV. Um, so we need to under, we need to never forget that there is this thing called tuberculosis. Um, and even though we are dealing with COVID right now, unless we consider, unless we consider TB also, and this is not just for South Africa, it's for most of Southern Africa and it's other, part, other parts of Africa, um, and it's becoming an emerging disease now in many of the first world developing countries. Um, so this is not this old age, old disease is becoming a new disease. We need to consider this critically important as well at this stage. And it's COVID has given us a bit of a backseat and it needs to be stepped up. The good thing, however, is that what COVID has learned us, there's a lot of things that are overlapping between TB and between COVID. And when we, when we bring in those, when we start using the knowledge we actually already have and apply it, then we can deal both of these diseases a big blow. Um, there's strong comparisons between the transmission methods, there's strong comparisons between the, uh, the way that we can deal with it and the solutions we have, especially from an environmental perspective. So, Florence Nightingale said this some years back. <laughs> it may seem strange principle to enunciate that the very first requirement in a hospital is that it should do the sick no harm. I mean, in those words, in many ways, are reverberating because that's exactly what we are, our environments are doing. Instead of keeping people safe, in you know, many, many ways, we are causing, causing disease in these spaces. So just sort of from a, one of the first, so I, and I call it Healthcare 101, one of the first epidemiological studies done by, unawaringly done by um, Florence Um, deaths in three cases, battle, which is the orange, then wounds from other causes, and then wounds from disease. And we lost one, outweighs it. And there's only one way that that could have happened is because it was congregated environments. It was, it was, it was these uh, um, uh, makeshift um, uh, hospital environments. Effectively, she's looked at the first quantitative investigation to infection spread in these spaces, in these environments. Um, and what does that mean for us today? It means that um, spaces where susceptible individuals are brought into close contact with infectious individuals. And how do we deal with that? In the built environment, these are healthcare environments, these are schools, correctional facilities, dormitories, churches, mosques, public transport spaces. These are those environments and as I said earlier, those massive urban migration numbers that are that we are going to be or that we are expecting, um, this becomes tantamount. Um, in so many of you obviously know this process and the cycle. Um, <clears throat> uh, uh, how does infection basically occur? Um, and there's these six points in the process. Well, first, you need a, a causative agent. It needs to have sufficient virulent numbers to destroy. Um, 
and I'm going to draw comparisons where the built environment actually is relevant to this. It's important to look at this from an interdisciplinary perspective. In fact, you should rather look at the disciplinary perspective. Um, because these agents are found in the built environment, which means we need to consider what the built environment is made up of. And then reservoirs, where organisms can reproduce body tissue, wasted human animals, sex contaminated food and water, and favorable conditions. Again, this is found in the built environment, these reservoirs. And it requires an exit portal with host to respiratory tract, intestinal tract, in a mode of transport, and that expands air surfaces in the environment, built environment. That is through your windows. That is through touching one trolley that's moving to the next room, that's through your ventilation systems. Um, and then it requires a portal of entry, pathogens can then enter, and that's obviously the hopefully the immunity is at a that is where your environment becomes very important. The environment in which you are dealing with. In other words, the average, the average person in your environment, what is their status of health? What is the level of immunity? Even the last one is also in the built environment. Let's just take one moment back and let's look at the probability of, your, of infection. There are hidden built environment factors in these in these calculations. So very very simplified probability of infection. There are four large categories: host, site of contact, time of contact, and then obviously a receptive host site. What really is important is that the dose. <clears throat> how many? these vectors are potentially being expelled in that space. Or well, how many of these particles, these airborne particles, or these uh, droplets are being expelled? What is the dose? And then what is the site of contact? Um, and how long is this occurring at that time? So suddenly we have time, we have spatial environment, and we have number of occupants in that spatial environment. Now, when we bring, when we consider that from a perspective of a built environment, we realize that those things are immediate responsible. Those things can be resolved through built environment solutions to reduce the probability of infection in that environment. We're not speaking about the immunity of each individual, we're looking at how to deal with it from an environmental perspective. When we think about the basic reproductive number, so in other words, for each sick person, how many people, subsequent new people will be infected? And we need to understand this when we deal with a specific pathogen type. So when you look at Ebola, we know it's by one to two, HIV by one to four. We know at this stage, um, we, we estimate that SARS-CoV-3 means we need to consider that in terms of how many people should be in space, congregating together, seated together, and how do we monitor that and manage that um, in order to achieve health environment for people that are all compromised? So contamination occurs by airborne droplet and through touch. Uh, it's it's, it's accepted that the spread of infectious bacteria, which is or bacteria or fungi or viruses or single cell organism, um, are first, and this is important, always first by human contagion and sick. Bring these pathogens into these environments. And uh, the knowledge is going to be there by themselves. Someone had to put them in there, and that environment becomes a very good environment for them, and they like to stay there, and depending on their, on their um, resilience. Um, and depending on the environmental conditions, they then like to stay there. When we think about SARS-CoV-2, um, we need to consider that both droplet and touch and airborne is relevant. You know, the touch to a, to a lesser extent, unless it's very immediate, but droplet and airborne most certainly. And those are interchangeable terms that I'm using now as an interchangeable concept, but I'm going to explain to you what 
on mean by droplet and airborne, because they are separate. And then secondly, each host can acquire microbes in two ways. Vertically, obviously, through inheriting it from the parents, or horizontally acquired. Majority of the COVID findings have indicated that it's uh, Yaku, we've lost you there. You lost me. Am I am I am I can you still hear me? Now I can hear you again. All right. Thanks, Anna. And to prevent the spread of antimicrobial resistance microorganisms, there's really two ways only we can do that. And one is optimizing antimicrobial use, and we all know that. I think all, every health delegate on this, on this call knows that. But the second one is to prevent the transmission of resistant organisms. And preventing that is in dealing with these environments, and preventing that is in, is, is in, is in, is in dealing with other, other options. Um, so preventing transmission at this stage, when we think about COVID-19, um, we need to look at environmental solutions, we need to look at administrative solutions, we need to look at PPE. Um, unfortunately, we have a slow uptake of vaccines, um, which is unfortunately going to lead to a very high likely next wave. Um, but I'm not going to say anything further on that. Let's hope that that changes in due course. So when we consider infection and risk factors, which determinants and settings with limited resources? And for this, we Africa and we count many other regions in Africa. Firstly, it's inadequate environmental hygienic conditions of waste disposal, where those things aren't in place. Most importantly, is poor infrastructure. Insufficient equipment, understaffing, overcrowding, poor knowledge and application of basic protocols, lack of knowledge in injection, blushing transfusion, and then absence of local and I've highlighted three items here in red, which speaks directly to the poor infrastructure, overcrowding, and absence of local We will always have these challenges, but it's hard to deal with what we have that will make the difference. So from an infection control perspective, obviously we need to look at the hierarchy of controls in order to determine which are the most feasible solutions to apply and reduce the risk. So we look at worker, patient, and facility, we need to look, we need to get that to administrative managerial solutions and personal protective equipment. It sort of works in the inverse triangle where we first have <clears throat> administrative and managerial outcomes. We then go and approach environmental solutions if we cannot do with it, policies and procedures. And then as a last option, we look at it as a as personal protective equipment. What is interesting over the last few months is sort of we, when we especially look at the COVID-19 and the way that it's sort of taken the world by storm <clears throat> and the way we have responded to it and the way that everyone is wearing masks. And it would have been absolutely fantastic if we were actually wearing masks in the way, in the same vigilant way that we're doing it now. Previously for um, the spread of tuberculosis and other similar diseases, um, I think we would have probably prevented a lot more but it sort of begs the question whether we need to rethink um, what the order of this, of this sort of triangle <laughs> actually should be. But I'm not gonna go into that discussion now. That's something we need to actually think about um, because there are some things that are sort of non-negotiables anymore and that also always need to occur. Um, where I think every person is now understanding the, the lot of the doctor or the nurse that have to constantly wash your hands um, and then go see the next patient. And I think we are starting to understand that. The laymen are starting to understand what that process is. And we are, I think we are slowly getting people to understand the process of, of, of infection prevention and control um, on a day-to-day -day simplified basis. And then secondly, it needs to reduce the concentration of infectious particles because that's the whole purpose of creating this cascade. So we need to reduce the risk and in order to reduce risk, we need to reduce the concentration of infectious particles. 
to reduce risk once environmental and administrative controls are in place. If they're not in place, it's going to be very difficult to reduce that risk. Another big question is, do we consider IPC in building design? And I mean, I'm going to unfortunately say that for majority of built environment professionals, the answer is no. Um, there's many times that we have, and I myself have, uh, do or provide guidance for, for specialists who are doing various healthcare facilities. In many of the cases, they don't actually have the knowledge and understanding of how. What's really important is this specific slide. We call this the basket approach. What this means is that I cannot just go and put surgical masks on. And this was from this research back in 2008. Um, I cannot just go and improve the ventilation system all the way up to 15 air changes. I cannot just go and employ UVGI. I cannot just go and put policies in place. Um, because if I do only one of those things, and this example was using measles, and I was only doing surgical masks because I was, or I was only doing ventilation, in other words, environmental, or I was only doing UVGI, or I was only doing policies. Um, it actually didn't make a major difference. But when I put all of those controls together, it made a very, very big impact on the effectiveness of those controls. In other words, and that's what we say, it's a basket approach. You need to review the risk, interdisciplinary solutions to that risk and then allow the, for the responsiveness of all those solutions as a collective. And that's why you need multiple people on the team to do that. So when we think about administrative controls, we consider managerial programs, practices, significantly in this instance, uh, reduce COVID-19, appropriate work practices, specific environmental <coughs> controls that are policy, um, define what settings certain respiratory uh, protection is required, adhere to national regulations or norms, or otherwise if they're not there, decontamination standards, set those things up. Uh, use CDC, WHO, or other reputable uh, guidance. And then the process of screening, triage and fast track, um, how did you identify your HACCP points, for example? And then providing training. And that is what administrative controls respond to. Environmental controls, and then we start speaking about ventilation, dilution, stack effect, buoyancy, and pressure. In other words, how do I use the natural ventilation that I drive airflow, but also make it environments that are <clears throat> relatively comfortable so that people will actually adhere to the requirement. Design principles, allowing certain design principles, putting those things in place. In other words, that's looking at flow processes. <coughs> <coughs> Apologies. Allowing certain people in certain environments, doing effective screening, and then looking at the appropriate applications of ultraviolet genocidal eye radiation, and then the material selection of, 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 of wall surfaces and other finishes. <coughs> is called avoidance or design out. That means simply <clears throat> considering separation of people and space in space. A second. Yaki, are you unmuted now? I'm sure he'll be back just now. Um, he do have a bronchitis, so he's, I think he's just grabbing a quick um, breath. Dr. Yaku, um, just let me know if you can hear us again. Thanks, Anna. Sorry, I just had a bit of a, <coughs> a coughing fit. Okay, no, that's just trying to get my breath back. Give me another couple of seconds.
Okay, we will carry on just now. Just give him a one second so just to catch his breath after the cough. We do appreciate him coming on while he is sick. Thank you. Okay, let's see. Let's see if we can continue this because <laughs> this is very important. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to start speaking a little bit slower. Let's see if we um, can get this critical information across. So when we look at avoidance or design art, um, we use that as a critical principle where the way that we design and plan is separating um, groups of people without creating stigma. And then we consider sec seclusion is what is seclusion and the difference between seclusion, um, separation and isolation. Because from a ventilation perspective, there are quite different solutions. Um, and why we say design art is because from the start, the concept or the idea is that you design the solution before you have the problem. In other words, bringing the, arc, bringing the right decision-making right in the design um, and not just looking for a post post factor solution, which is often what we have in many facilities. That further. We speak about mitigation and it's the bundle approach, where it's not just one solution, but it's a multiple solutions. So we look at standard precautions, We patients that have um, sorry, Yaku, we are missing you again. We just hear a uh, here and there word. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Is that slightly better? That's better now, thank you. Okay, great. Thanks. And then what's important is when you also look at systems proofing. What happens if I've got all these mechanical systems in place? And then the power fails. And now I've got an entire building that it relies on a certain system but cannot be achieved because I haven't system proofed the solution. And then people proofing. Sounds odd, but this is one of the most important points. And I'm going to give an example of what we mean by people proofing. If you, for example, in the nurse's station, if you let's use let's use a, a high risk environment. Um, whether it's a COVID ward or a PUI ward or a tuberculosis ward. Um, and you have a nurse's station and you have a central mechanical ventilation system that is providing individual air to each of these spaces and it's extracting air, creating a positive pressure at the nurse's station. In other words, the air is blowing into the nurse's station and blowing away from the nurse's station so that it moves into the other spaces so that the potential um, contaminants aren't moving towards the nurse's station. But then we put the switch for that system at the nurse's station. In the summer, it's great because it's nice and cool. But now in the winter, it becomes cold. And so the nurses are getting cold. But they now know that if they put the switch off, it gets nice and warm. Unbeknownst to them, they're actually completely shifting the system and making that space, that, that space really dangerous for themselves. And that is what we mean by people proofing it, taking away those kind of switches, taking away that they were not access um, for comfort, but access for safety. So how do we people proof systems so that people cannot mix up systems and therefore create higher risk environments? And what other risks or what other things do I put in place to achieve that? And then we need to look at building materials. Materials, Surfaces, what surfaces am I using for floors? What surfaces am I using for walls or for ceilings? How cleanable are they? And what is the persistence of certain hardy uh, nosocomial um, that could be possibly at the surface that I'm considering and so on. And then we look at standard support surfaces and uh, uh, precautions. And those are typical things. That's alcohol hand rub at the bedside, optimizing clinical washout basins, 
and pulls and cleans. And I'm just going to stop at that one for a, just a brief second. There's this very interesting situation or scenario that's currently happening, um, especially now. I think it's escalated with the current COVID era, where we have um, sanitizers or sanitizing stations, and we are slowly removing or moving away from using the basin, and we just rather going to the sanitizer at the door at the door entrance and exit which is great because it's at the door exit and entrance so you as a doctor or as a nurse immediately wash your hands before you enter in so the previous contamination from another space won't occur and as you exit but here's the here's the counter challenge at the moment those basins are in fact being used less and less so what is happening is that there are not a lot of water flow through those basins and what we have is we've got something called Legionella that's forming in those, in, those, in those drains. And the moment I open up that, that water spot and it's not flowing straight immediately into that basin, it suddenly um, aerosolizes the Legionella inside that. And unless I have maintained my system effectively through whether it is by uh, uh, chlorine bombs in the system at a certain intervals, monthly intervals, um, I actually have a much, much higher risk now because I'm having underused, underused basins that have potential to cause other risks. And we've actually seen events and cases like this. A colleague of mine, a friend of mine back in Canada at the university, he's actually had to do an investigation of a number of patients being who were killed as a result of, of that. Um, and they couldn't work out why it was until they managed to calculate to see what the, what, what, the, what the impact was, and it was exactly something like this. We need to look at non-porous and impervious. Um, what can host um, environments such as, um, which is high, high uh, um, prisms that, are, that, can, that can live in extreme heat and extreme uh, uh, low quantities of water, <coughs> high heat and high in what are the surface materials to be used, copper and the appropriateness of that or aging and technology and the effectiveness of that. And then obviously we look at assembly details, um, floor details and then the workflow, which is the spatial sequencing configuration. So, can it be assumed that, that we as, as built environments professionals, us, or those people that are be working with you at your facilities and your environments actually know how to do that, know how to embed IPC in these environments. But with your understanding of the built environment, your understanding of, of health, and that's why I'm drawing strong comparisons in this presentation specifically with, with elements that we know from a health care or a, or a <coughs> um, health perspective, how do we draw that to a built environment perspective? Because we know the flora from the built environment, endemic or epidemic, um, uh, causes environmental infections. And that is where it's in damp areas. It could be in London, it could be in the equipment, it could be in the food, it could be in the fine dust and tropic nuclei. There's many studies showing that if there's, a, um, if, if, there's, if there's some construction happening at a facility next door, immediately next to the facility, um, there is a number of uh, contaminants that are then uh, uh, such as aspergillus and so on that gets um, aerosolized and you can see that through the ventilation systems it goes into the building and suddenly you have an increased rate of infections. <clears throat> so we need to consider when we're building on, when we're adding new additions or new um, construction to facilities, how are we dealing with that? in fine dust and in droplet nuclei. And that is why it's critically important because bacteria that's smaller than 10 micrometers in diameter remain in the air for a long time, several hours. And it can also be inhaled in the same way as dust can be inhaled into your lungs. So it is possible to be infected by touching surfaces and objects, and we know that. Yaku, I just want to ask you, we will need to take a break at, um, for the translators. Um, if you can quickly maybe just wrap up this one. Thank you. Common surfaces such as door handles, light fittings, buttons, those, those, what are those materials made of? 
And how often am I touching those, those surfaces? Then there's this new field called the microbiology of the built environment. And in many ways, the image on the right hand side are all those different. Sorry, we've lost you. Can you hear me? Sorry, we've lost your voice there. So you spoke about the microbiology in the environment and then. Yes. Okay. All right. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Anna, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, great. Um, so when I go back to the slide, in many ways, this is exactly what our buildings look like. Or actually, these petri dishes are telling us actually what our buildings are made up of, all these different organisms that are living in these spaces and the way that they fit and work together. That is why I want to draw this comparison. When we look at the human body, we know that it's got a heart, it's pumping blood, and we've got water and all kinds of other systems inside it. And each part of the body requires the the toes needed to be pumped, blood you need to get there, food needs to get there, and with every other element. Well, a building is really exactly the same. If one you're going to get ill, and that is how we get this, this whole concept of sick building syndrome and angel of uh, nosocomial infection and so on. So we need to look at the systems of buildings in the same way that we consider the systems of the body functioning in a building, it becomes a sick building. But the systems of the body functioning, it becomes an ill body. It's a complex environment and it's driven by various ecological drivers as in nature, um, but it mostly gets colonized by these hardy invasive species. Um, it's built environments act as barriers between us and the types of microbial diversity that we have. Built environment has got very singular diversity. Um, and we actually need that diversity. That's why we need to get out of our buildings more often um, in order for our... So what we've done in a, in a recent um, study is that we've looked at uh, hospital environments um, in South Africa, and I did a study on the built environment and spatial analytics, as well as doing a lot of microbial samples to see what are the different impacts of these two environments and what is it, how does it work. And when we look at hospitals, we often consider that they are very, um, they are driven by very strong programs, but have a tendency to shift between weak and strong. The office environments have weaker programs. Um, what do we mean by that? A weak means a space that is configuration dependent, which means the way I design it, the way it's on the floor, it's the way I use it. But if it's got a strong program, that means that the policies that you put in place over rules just the planning of that space. So the, and you need to consider how is your healthcare environment planned functioning? Um, because how is determined, uh, determines how microbiomes because we need this balanced structure and functional richness. This is an example of what we actually find when we look at these different environments. That there's clearly two different two different environments happening. There's an air community and there is a surface community, and that community actually varies in different seasons. All of these again needs to be done the seasonally, and we also need to manage IPC from an environmental air perspective, as well as um, from a surface perspective. Hey, Yaku, can I just, Yaku, can I just interrupt you? Um, we need to take a break. The translators sure. uh, won't be able to carry on. So if we can just take that five minute break. So if you Let's can stop that. sharing, then I will share the video quickly, just so Let's they can that. also catch their breath. Thank you. So to all the presenters, uh, everybody, we're just taking a, a short break just to for everybody to catch their breath and then we'll carry on. But we will ask Dr. Yaku to also wrap up because we've got another speaker as well. So let me just share my screen for you, with you. Can you see my screen? I hope so. 
This COVID-19 infection control and occupational health Listen to the Experts video series was produced by the CSIR. This video clip was produced in support of the South African National Department of Health in its fight to reduce the transmission and impact of COVID-19 on South Africa's healthcare sector. Hi everyone, I'm Matthew Mpashele, an infection prevention and control specialist. In this video, I'm going to be talking about the steps that healthcare workers and health facilities need to take uh, when a COVID case has been identified among staff within a healthcare setting. So the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic has uh, claimed so many lives of healthcare workers and uh, patients. And to some extent, uh, it has become a threat to the economic well-being of healthcare facilities to an extent that some of the facilities, they had to decide or contemplate a closing down. Uh, COVID-19 has affected uh, how the hospitals are designed, how they are used and how um, the services are provided. Some of the facilities had to hire additional staff in order to deal with the influx of patients. Throughout the pandemic, healthcare workers have uh, played an important role by treating patients and they have put their lives at risk to protect others. And as such, um, they are doubly affected by the mere fact that uh, they are members of the community and also there is a risk of acquiring the disease from the patients that they treat and simultaneously uh, transmit to uh, other patients. Therefore, as healthcare facilities, it is important that you identify and manage healthcare workers that have been infected with COVID-19 as soon as possible, so as to prevent healthcare transmission and also to protect other healthcare workers and vulnerable patients. As more healthcare workers get infected with COVID-19, the present question facing you as healthcare facilities is whether or not to shut down a facility after a concerned case has been identified among staff. The answer is no. There is no legal requirement in South Africa that compels you as healthcare facilities to shut down. However, as per the national guidelines on uh, outbreak investigation, you as facilities may need to close the affected area temporarily, be it a ward, a unit, or a department. This is to allow decontamination to take place as there may be a risk of contracting COVID-19 from the contaminated surfaces. Careful consideration needs to be made to determine whether containment of the outbreak can be made without closing the affected area. This is to avoid uh, disruption of service delivery and also moving patients around in case risk. When temporary closure is unavoidable, you as healthcare facilities need to come up with alternative capacity measures. This is to minimize the impact on health service delivery and patient outcomes. Some of the examples that may lead to temporary closure of the affected area may be the area to be cleaned and disinfected is too large to be completed while it is in use. Secondly, the number of staff uh, that have contracted COVID-19 and are in isolation is large and the facility has not identified replacement staff. Thirdly, the number of staff that are direct contact and are also in quarantine is large and replacement staff had also not been identified. And lastly, due to non-compliance to occupational health and safety legislation and infection prevention and control guidelines. At the same time, the COVID task team should continue investigations to identify people who have come into contact with a confirmed case during the infectious period. The COVID task team should conduct a targeted uh, risk assessment that takes into account uh, the risk that may arise due to COVID. Remember, temporary closure of the affected area can be avoided by completing staff screening timelessly, rapidly cleaning and disinfecting the affected area 
once decontamination has been completed, seconding staff from the other areas and ensuring compliance with the Occupational Health and Safety Regulation. Keep in mind, the IPC measures require constant reinforcement by means of written documents, training, mentoring, and monitoring implementation. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. We've um, just got now the break. I'm sure everybody's got their um, breath back. We're just going to allow Dr. Yakunach to just quickly do the ventilation part so we can still have time for um, Dr. Nyepeti from Mozambique to also do a C presentation. Over to you, Yaku. Thank you, Anna. Going to try and wrap up quickly in the last bits is are critically important for everyone to know. <clears throat> Um, and that is just understanding ventilation and understanding the, why it's important um, and, and the applications to that. So, so when we consider aerosols, we've got uh, two different, basically two different sizes. And that's what I mentioned earlier when we look at droplet and airborne, because they are, they are different. Um, we look at an, an, an aerosol, which is, uh, is greater than five micrometers in diameter, and which means it, it can in fact tra travel more than six feet in distance which means the way I need to manage and, and, and provide solutions for that is different to a droplet. The droplet is a heavier particle, which is greater than five micro um, meter diameter, uh, diameter, and it will therefore carry a lot less than, than six feet in distance and therefore stay um, suspended for a lot less and causing potential foamage or potential fallout onto surfaces and therefore can be then picked up by a susceptible host, either through touching a surface or um, or it could be even, even on that surface, stay, stay viable for some time. Important because if I go to the next slide, um, you'll see that the terminal set, and this is important, you, you're going to get this presentation. So consider this in the, in the basis of the uh, aerosol dynamics of your specific pathogens that you consider. If it's one micrometers, it can stay in it will stay in the air for up to nine, up to eight, 7.9 hours, even longer. And 140 meters, which means they will travel from one side to your facility all the way to the next, if there, if there is a ventilation system that's working. And that could even be tuberculosis, as an example. And then the, more, the larger it gets, five or 10 or 50, the quicker it falls to the surface, the less distance it can travel. And that's why we speak about near field and far field transmission. Um, when we speak about COVID, COVID is in the, sits at that point where we're almost speaking about a near field transmission, where we're saying that it can be through droplet, it can be picked up in the air, and therefore it can go up to six meters, which means it is on that edge of being airborne and not airborne. And that is why there's been so much communication and discussions around the airborne nature of, of COVID. And that is again, once if it, and that's if it's in an aerosol format, in other words, if it's in a droplet format, if it's even smaller, and in a smaller droplet, it could travel further. Um, the um, hierarchy of ventilation, um, our first solution must always be passive ventilation systems. Why? Because passive ventilation system doesn't cost us money. It is lower maintenance solutions. And we can get the amount of quantity of air that we can get through passive ventilation is a lot more than through mechanical systems. By opening windows, the amount of air changes. Air changing mean if I've got a room, and I'm going to quickly give you a calculation, let's say the room is three meters by three meters, and it's got a height of three meters. That means it's got a nine by three, um, so that's a 27 cubes. Um, and it's how many times can I change 27 cubes of air per hour? Now, I should be at least changing and in, in the healthcare settings, at least, in South Africa, the building regulation says eight. We say at least 12 to 15 times we need to change the air in that space for that space to be safe. In other words, it's saying that that air is being changed almost every half an hour is what I need to do. And through national ventilation, it's the easiest and cheapest way to do that. Then secondly, um, I look at hybrid systems where I use climate adaptability, where I've got a system which does a bit of both. It uses both um, climate solutions, in other words, density and buoyancy, um, because warm air rises. So cool air comes in, um, I allow it to rise, and I have these stacks, in other words, these chimneys, and then I pull the air through that, and it causes ventilation, especially if I don't have double-sided windows. And it can pull the air through that space, 
and I will still get some level of, and I can then have assisted mechanical ventilation, such as a fan or an extractive fan to assist the process. And lastly, I can go to fully mechanical ventilation where I have a full mechanical system that, that, that says that I actually need to close my windows or at least to a minimum have majority of my windows closed. I have a constant airflow number. Certain environments, we require mechanical full ventilation systems because we need to have a controlled environment, especially in our theaters and so on. But full mechanical systems require very good maintenance processes and programs in place because I need to look at my HEPA filters and other filtration systems. And if they are not in place, I will not know that unless I've got some kind of system that shows me that. Um, <clears throat> we look at this, for example, and this diagram shows you the transmission um, comparison when I have a better ventilation. Um, and the better the ventilation and the lower the occupancy, the least possible transmission occurs. Um, there's various ventilation models, and I mentioned this earlier. First one is the oscillation model. Um, and this specifically is contact infection isolation for touch. And this, this is the touch isolation um, where mixing ventilation, aerosol, and the resuspension. This is a negative pressure room with an, where an anti room is not, for example, required. Um, this is, in other words, saying that the air must be drawn in from the outside into the room, meaning the patient is the one that's ill and could potentially contaminate the rest of the spaces. And then when we say airborne isolation, this is a negative pressure that requires for airborne infection. In other words, patients that have anything that is airborne linked or related. When it's a positive pressure, it means I require positive pressure isolation. Um, where in positive pressure, I'll only use that in cases where I, for example, um, need, to save, need to keep the patient safe and not necessarily the people outside safe. When we do that, the exhaust must be discharged away at least three meters from any other opening. Otherwise, we are creating a short circuit. And what we are pulling out, or pushing out, or extracting out just goes back into the next room. And we have seen many of those examples, actually. To airborne infection isolation on negative pressure spaces, that, for example, is for measles, TB, and SARS. When I'm pulling it in from the corridor into the isolation space, and then I'm extracting it through the bathroom. When I have mixing ventilation, is I don't need to have completely clean air. I can also use the filters to clean the air, which means I don't have to have 100%. Especially depending on your country's own regulation, you need to consider that. But this must have negative pressure. And in more severe cases, an anti-room is even better because often the moment you open up those doors, you have a potential to create what we call a plume and it actually pulls out the air. So the door firstly must swing inwards and the door mustn't be on a sensor, which means it opens up all the time. Because every time the door opens, it pulls air either out of the room or it pulls air into the room. And depending on what the patient is inside, it could be detrimental or to the outside. Effective isolation is that when we say a positive pressure or an aseptic protection. In other words, where there's burns patients, it's a good example. Uh, bubble or sink anti rooms for burns rooms. And at the game, this, your approach here depends on what is the adjacent spaces. Um, it protects the patient, it protects the burn patient from not getting infected by what's in the main corridor or what other, other illnesses are there. Um, and we call here as cascading, which means we change the pressure, air pressure, systematically throughout um, final extraction. Uh, well, I want to get you, and then when you look at high level isolation, i.e. viral hemorrhagic fevers, um, this is completely a different scenario. And this requires very detailed and planning design where you have to have them completely isolated, controlled environments, specific patient access routes. There has to be internal access to labs and decontaminated equipment. Very important do's and don'ts. Don't use dual pressure isolation. In other words, we often see designs to save money. It can be positive and negative depending on what you decide. Don't do that. The chances are it's not going to work, which means it's going to be neither. Don't share ventilation systems or electrical conduits with other wards, because what most likely what you are going to be extracting in the one ward is going to go into the next ward. Don't use swing doors and units without anti rooms, exactly for the same reason I mentioned earlier. That plume can go in or out, and that will actually defeat the whole point of isolators. And then don't heap up for the exhausts unless the respiratory protection is beside, because HEPA filters are extremely expensive 
And putting it on the external at the, as a final point is actually just making the outside air clean for the outside air. So it's not making no difference. It needs to be in line in the process if you are going to be recycling that air back. And still, we need to consider why. What things can you do and should you do? What we say is firstly, interlock supply and exhaust systems. Which other words means I cannot open that door unless the system is running, unless it's active. Don't go and use pressure gradients that is greater than 10 pascals. It's less than that. It will most likely not be cascading effectively. You will most likely have some of that air returning. Use visual air pressure indicators, such as the image on the right hand side. If that ball is hanging in the middle, you know that the air pressure is actually working, the ventilation system is working. Other ways to do that is by just taking a piece of cloth, putting it underneath the door um, where there's an opening to see if the air is flowing in or out. Hang sliding doors on the outside of the room. That means that you can fix it. You don't have to go into the environment in the event that there's a problem or an issue. Use automatic door closers, but avoid perimeter sensing door openers, as I mentioned earlier. Isolation is not separation. Separation says I have the same strain and I can separate them. Isolation means I have different strains of different categories of people in the same environment, and I need to separate them from different ventilation systems. And then plan, design, and cost appropriate. I don't think I have too much more time, Anna. Um, I'm just going to go to the end. Um, these are core, very important factors we need to consider, such as salutogenic environments and what that means. It's thinking about your environments and using evidence right decision making because we've got a lot of data out there you just need to use that information and apply data for your own solutions on on health problems and challenges with patients so we have the same amount of data out there for for health for mental solutions and we just need to go and apply it you'll see all these uh information in the end um there's some really interesting examples on healthy buildings. And finally, we've got some guidance that someone has written. So have a look at that. It's a really great building. Um, no, I didn't, I'm not a co-author on that, but it's definitely worth, worth having a read. And unfortunately for me as an architect or as a built environment uh, specialist in healthcare, um, uh, my mistakes are always going to be visible. Um, so I can't just put a vine outside. I actually need to make sure it works right from the start. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yaku. Um, and um, yes, thank you very much. And I think for all of you, this these presentations will be available. And um, I'm sure Dr. Yaku, Yaku will also be available um, if you want to maybe contact him directly, if you've got any other questions. Um, he will look at some of the questions at the moment in the Q&A box, but I'm going to hand over. So if you can stop sharing, uh, Yaku, we're going to hand over to Dr. Um, Agustinu Mbieti. Sorry, doctor, if I mispronounce your surname or your name. He, he's the Minister of Health in Mozambique, and he's going to give us a presentation on the country's perspective now during the COVID. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, Aria, you will be sharing the presentation in English, but he will be speaking in Portuguese. Um, so the English speakers will be able to follow on the English version on this one. Thank you, over. Boa tarde a todos, muito obrigado pela permissão. Gostaria de apresentar a experiência de Moçambique em relação à prevenção e controle de infecções. Passa. Passa. Passa o slide. Portanto, contexto nacional... Temos alguns antecedentes eh, em relação ao PCI, portanto, nós começamos o programa. Slide seguinte. Seguinte. Portanto, nós começamos eh, o programa do PCI em 2004, com o advento do, do HIV-Sida. E nós começamos com quatro, com seis hospitais, é, que correspondia na altura a 0,4%, e 
Em 2009, subimos para 144 unidades sanitárias, evoluímos 8,3%. Em 2019, nós tínhamos evoluído para 12%. Portanto, de 2019 para cá, por a questão do, da pandemia do HIV, nós não progredimos mais. O mais importante para saber é que nós estamos em todos os hospitais centrais, todos os hospitais provinciais, todos os hospitais gerais, distritais e alguns centros de saúde. Passa... Portanto, em 2004 iniciamos o programa, mas este programa só foi institucionalizado como um programa nacional em 2019. Portanto, entre 2010 e 2013, nós ocupamos pela elaboração dos manuais de referência, estratégia de gestão de resíduos hospitalares e manual do formador, para permitir a formação do, do, dos trabalhadores. Em 2015, o programa foi descentralizado. Quer dizer, a gestão, a gestão do programa deixou de ser exclusivamente do nível central e passou a ser também do nível provincial. Passa. Seguinte. Portanto, os objetivos essenciais deste programa foi prevenir a ocorrência de infecções graves resultantes da prestação de qualquer tipo de cuidado que envolva procedimentos não invasivos e minimizar o risco de transmissão de infecções graves aos, aos utentes e trabalhadores de saúde, incluindo as suas comunidades. Seguinte. Seguinte, portanto, este programa está é, inserido no Departamento de Enfermagem ao nível central, portanto, faz parte de uma repartição do Departamento de Enfermagem em que se circunscreve a esterilização dos, dos diversos materiais, é, secção de gestão de resíduos hospitalares e secção de avaliação de qualidade. Portanto, como instrumentos que orientam este programa, temos um diploma ministerial de 13 barra 2006, que se debruça sobre, eh, define o lixo biomédico e as modalidades do seu tratamento. Temos também o regulamento de gestão do lixo biomédico, manual de referência do PCI, as diretrizes do PCI e a Estratégia Nacional de Gestão do Lixo. Estes são documentos que foram, no entanto, elaborados no âmbito deste programa. E no contexto da Covid-19, nós elaboramos uma lista de verificação do PCI para ajudar os trabalhadores de saúde a cumprir com aquilo que são as normas do PCI. Quer dizer... A, a aplicação das práticas seguras, como a higiene das mãos, o uso correto do equipamento de proteção individual, as sepsias e outras medidas seguras para a, a, a prevenção de infecções. Seguinte. Estes são alguns dos instrumentos que nós eh, elaboramos. Portanto, falei de manual de referência e a imagem à direita mostra aquilo que é o, o instrumento de medição do desempenho das unidades sanitárias em PCI. Porque, portanto, nós fazemos a avaliação do desempenho das unidades sanitárias em PCI. Seguinte. Como funções a vários níveis é, é, dessas comissões do PCI, a nível nacional nós definimos políticas que devem ser observadas por todos ao nível das unidades sanitárias, elaboramos instrumentos orientadores 
coordenamos todas as atividades do PCI, fazemos também a supervisão das atividades ao nível do país, para além da, da avaliação e formação do pessoal em PCI. Porque nós sabemos que uh, é necessário fazer a atualização do conhecimento em relação às medidas do PCI, periodicamente, aos trabalhadores da saúde. Uh, uh, ao nível provincial e distrital, também existe essa atividade de supervisão, avaliação e formação ao, ao, nível, ao seu nível. Seguinte... Mais? Seguinte. Ok. É, no, 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 ao nível das unidades sanitárias, este, esta equipe cresce um bocadinho mais, porque é a área onde se desenvolve todas as atividades inerentes ao PCI. Falei no slide anterior da, das boas práticas seguras, mas também eh, a gestão de resíduos biomédicos, como a segregação dos resíduos, acondicionamento, transporte, estacionamento temporário e destruição final. Por favor. Ok. Eh, como disse anteriormente, nós fazemos as avaliações este programa rege-se pelas avaliações internas e externas. As avaliações internas são realizadas pela equipe da unidade sanitária. Portanto, cada unidade sanitária tem uma equipe que vai realizando as, as avaliações externas de forma trimestral. Cada três meses eles fazem uma avaliação interna. As avaliações externas são feitas por indivíduos fora da unidade sanitária. Significa que há uma equipe que sai... Da, da província vai para uma unidade sanitária, vai fazer esta avaliação, ou do ministério vai fazer esta avaliação. E o padrão mínimo exigido para considerar uma unidade sanitária com desempenho aceitável é de 80%. Significa que de todas as áreas que nós fazemos avaliação, se a unidade sanitária atingir em todas, 80% esta pode ser acreditada como sendo uma unidade sanitária com desempenho aceitável. Seguinte. Seguinte. Nós temos comissões, é, comissões, comissões que são representadas por todos os cidadãos, portanto, a atual da lavandaria, da cozinha, é, de gestão, enfim, todos. É, desculpa, eu tinha o, o microfone desligado. Eu dizia que é, a todos os níveis nós temos convenções do PCI. Entretanto, ao nível das unidades sanitárias, o grupo cresce mais, porque é a área onde nós realizamos todas as atividades relacionadas com este programa. Portanto, todos e da unidade sanitária. A atividade desta comissão é de velar por todos os aspectos relacionados com as normas do PCI. Seguinte. 
um, este mapa uh, ilustra as unidades sanitárias que estão a implementar o programa em cada província deste país. Portanto, o número à esquerda representa as unidades sanitárias que estão a implementar o programa em relação às unidades sanitárias existentes naquela província. E como nós podemos depreender nesta imagem, praticamente nenhuma província conseguiu ter no mínimo 50% das unidades sanitárias a implementar o programa. Por isso ainda temos muitos desafios. Temos muitos desafios para a implementação destes programas ao nível do país. Seguinte. Ok. Uh, aqui nos problemas identificados, uh, me referi que no âmbito de convite nós implementamos a lista de verificação do PCI. Esta lista uh, e o cumprimento escrupuloso dos das medidas do PCI, porque verificou-se que haviam muitas lacunas no cumprimento das normas do PCI. Então, para garantir a segurança dos utentes e dos trabalhadores de saúde, nós criamos esta lista de verificação de forma a garantir este cumprimento, controlar as normas de paramentação e desparamentação dos profissionais de saúde, sobretudo também porque entendemos que nesta área de paramentação e desparamentação dos profissionais de saúde, havia lacunas e muitos profissionais infectavam-se nesta ocasião. Portanto, foi muito útil, demonstrou-se que é, era possível controlarmos estas atividades através dessa lista de verificação. Agora, o nosso desafio agora é a expansão dessa lista para mais unidades sanitárias, porque neste momento estamos a trabalhar em 99 unidade sanitária. Também visava garantir o aprovisionamento do, do equipamento de proteção individual ao nível das unidades sanitárias. Isto é, era possível, no fim de cada semana, sabermos qual é a quantidade de equipamento de proteção individual que nós temos na unidade sanitária e, de forma célere, fazermos uma requisição para aumentar o nosso estoque e avaliar o cumprimento destas normas. Outros problemas é, seguinte. Por favor. Outros problemas que inquietam o, o, o nosso programa aqui é que não há nenhum sistema de vigilância epidemiológica integrado para as infecções intrahospitalares. O que é que eu quero dizer com isso? Quero dizer que é, nós, até este momento, não estamos a fazer o controle efetivo das infecções dentro do hospital. Estamos a fazer, sim, a prevenção. Então, não temos nenhum... É, Sistema de Vigilância Epidemiológica Integrada das Infecções Intrahospitalares. É verdade que nós estamos a trabalhar nesta, neste sentido. Já começamos a fazer algum trabalho para ver se nós conseguimos fazer é, esta vigilância. É mesmo por isso que nós não temos nenhuma informação epidemiológica das infecções que estão a, a ocorrer nas unidades sanitárias. Também nunca descobrimos nenhum surto intrahospitalar por causa desta falta de controle. Na verdade, temos problemas de recursos humanos, temos problemas sérios de recursos humanos que, de certa forma, contribuem para esta situação, para além de, de questões de infraestrutura. Seguinte. Seguinte.
Okay. Temos aqui propostas de solução de alguns desafios. Tem... Existem doações de equipamentos de várias marcas e de vários modelos. Então, isso dificulta, de certa forma, uh, o aprovisionamento de acessório para a reparação destes equipamentos. E além da situação de deficiência de manutenção. Portanto, nós temos aqui atividades aroladas que visam resolver esses problemas a curto, médio e longo prazo. Mas são questões que nos inquietam, de certa forma, porque não conseguimos manter esses equipamentos de forma a funcionar continuamente. E muito obrigado pela atenção que me dispensaram. Thank you very much, Dr. Nyebe. Dr. Wande, I don't know if you just want to say something. There is no open questions um, at the moment, so I don't think there's anything that we need to address, but maybe you just want to say a word over to you, Dr. Wande. Um, um, thank you very much and thank you to all of the um, esteemed speakers and of course the participants. Uh, I think this was quite an um, exciting session. It was good to hear um, the perspective from Mozambique, um, but I don't think we have um, enough time for uh, questions, uh, but most of the questions have been answered. Um, and I, I would let you speak on to wrapping the session and the uh, certificates that will go on to the participant. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Wanda. And yes, thank you again to our presenters. Thank you to Dr. Yaku Nice and Dr. Niepe Betty to um, have their time available. And it's great to hear what Mozambique is also doing. And I think uh, if we will try in the next series as well to get more perspective from our Portuguese and Arabic countries as well to present on to this sessions. Uh, we're going to wrap up series nine now. And then we will have one week break and then we will start with series 10 um, in one week's time, which will then be, let me just double check on the date, will be on the 3rd of November. Um, the French will also continue tomorrow and then they will also have one week break and carry on. For your certificates, you will uh, need to have registered for uh, attending all the webinars, at least four out of the six and then you need to just stay on at least 60 minutes. Um, Susan, which work in the background, is checking all of that out and she will be sending out the, the certificates. All the webinars, um, presentations, after we've confirmed with all the presenters that we can upload it, will be uploaded on the ICANN website. And if you click on the ICANN website, you will see webinars and it will show all the different series and you will be able to see it there. So thank you very much to everybody and thank you for your time and have a good afternoon.